Welcome to this talk about the King's Lynn War Memorial, which celebrates its centenary in January 2021. The records for the War Memorial Committee are held within the King's Lynn Borough Archives. This script is adapted from a talk given on the War Memorial and Roll of Honour in 2018. The Great War had ended. The Town Council's minutes from November 1918 do not mark the ending of the war with any special entry. Business simply continued as normal. Formal peace celebrations were instead held on the 6th of July 1919. However, thoughts had already turned to creating a permanent memorial to those who had been killed. It was decided that a committee should be formed to oversee the matter. This initiative led to the creation of the war memorial that stands in Tower Gardens and the role of honour. This will be a look at the slightly troubled process of organising, building and writing these memorials. We start with this small and slightly smoke-damaged volume, which contains the minutes of the War Memorial Committee. The damage was possibly caused by a fire in the town clerk's office in 1946. The first meeting of the committee was held on the 4th of April 1919. It met with the purpose of raising public subscriptions to build a war memorial for the soldiers, sailors and airmen from Kings Lynn who had died. There were several suggestions for the form that the memorial should take. For example, Mr Perry suggested the engrossment on parchment of the names of the fallen which was to be kept within the records of the town hall. The bulk of the fund was to be used for some beneficial purpose. Mr Parsons suggested an inexpensive monument to be placed in Tower Gardens and a fund for the alleviation of distress amongst widows and orphans be established. Mr Williamson hoped the memorial would not be a cheap affair, but instead worthy of the borough. Councillor Raby expressed the best form of memorial would be one that benefited the living, while Mr Bristow suggested improvements to the hospital, which at that time was located just to the south of the walks and a record of the names would be kept there. Drawings and design suggestions for a permanent memorial were also received and presented during the meeting. The Mayor, Percival Chatterton, reminded the meeting that the borough had been offered a tank. It was one of a number of pieces of equipment offered to the borough by the War Office Trophies Committee. This is an interesting side story and is covered in more detail on the Norfolk Record Office blog. There will be a link to the blog in the video description. At the second meeting of the committee, two principal aims were agreed. First, that a permanent memorial containing the names of all the fallen be created in a public space. The second was to set up a fund to supplement the pensions of the widows and the children of the fallen. Those subscribing could determine how much of their donation went to either initiative. A small executive committee was formed to oversee the work and report back. Several amendments, including the creation of cottages for the dependents of the fallen, were proposed and rejected over the next few meetings. During the meeting held on the 15th of December 1919, 
it was decided to abandon the proposal to supplement the pensions of the widows and orphans in order to concentrate on the building of a permanent war memorial. As part of their work, the committee members visited an exhibition of war memorials to look at the designs and meet the architects. It was held at the Victoria and Albert Museum in June of 1919. It was decided that the memorial was to be placed at the entrance to the public walks on London Road. The architect, Mr Oswald Milne, was invited to design the monument. He and his partner, Paul Phipps, would go on to build a reputation for working on grand country houses. It is not stated if he was one of those exhibiting at the V&A or if the committee met them at another event. On Monday 9th of February 1920, their plans were shown to the committee. The memorial was to be circular in design built of Portland stone with four cast bronze panels. Three of the panels would contain the names of the fallen and the fourth would show the borough's coat of arms. Wreaths, also in bronze, were to be displayed on the top step. The names of the battles and theatres where the men had fought were to be included to highlight the global nature of the conflict. The estimate was £2,850 and the committee set themselves a target to raise £3,000. Up until this point it has been a fairly typical project. Forming committees and raising funds from public subscription towards specific goals was a proven format the corporation had used on many occasions and would continue to be used in later years. The difference for this initiative was the target to raise a specific amount of money. Usually, ideas were presented funds were raised and they then dictated the scale of the event. This is where the committee first ran into trouble. £3,000 was a far higher target than they had previously tried to raise. To put that figure into context we will look at two earlier examples. For the Duke of York's wedding present, upon his marriage to Princess Victoria Mary of Teck in 1893, £174, 7 shillings and sixpence were raised. This paid for a pair of hunting guns to be sent. The Duke of York would later become King George V. For Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee in 1887, money was raised for three initiatives. The first was a fund for the Imperial Institute, which was being set up, with the aim of encouraging trade links within the Empire. It still exists today, albeit as the Commonwealth Institute. A total of two hundred and thirty six pounds eighteen shillings and sixpence was raised for it. The second initiative was to support a local entertainment fund to put on a show for the elderly and poor children of the town. In total five hundred and seventy one pounds ten shillings and threepence was raised. This entertainment fund was always a popular choice and had been an objective that regularly featured in other public subscriptions. The third and final initiative was to create a Victoria Avenue inside the walks. 
This idea was quickly dropped when the cost of maintaining the avenue was presented to the town council. The money was redistributed between the two other funds, with the exception of one individual who wanted their money donated to the Lynn Visiting Society instead. In total, if my old money edition is correct, eight hundred and eight pounds, eight shillings and nine pence were raised. This was the largest public subscription event prior to the War Memorial. By the meeting held on the 22nd of July 1920, 2,249 pounds, 14 shillings and tuppence had been raised, far below the intended target. Despite repeated calls for more subscriptions, and a little help from bank interest, the final total would only reach £2,272, 12 shillings and 5 pence. The plan had to be altered. Two letters were received from Oswald Mill, suggesting ways the price could be reduced while retaining the size of the monument. One idea changed the design from circular to octagonal and removed a step. Another suggested the removal of the bronze panels, either totally or partially, and having the names inscribed directly into the stone. The panels had an estimated cost of £330 for the plates carrying the names, and £250 for the coat of arms. It was again suggested that the names of the fallen could be removed entirely from the memorial and instead be recorded on a roll in the guild hall. This would allow for the bronze panel with the borough crest to remain. In the second letter from Milne, two new estimates were given. After removing the bronze panels, but leaving the wreaths and other decorations, and inscribing the names in the stone, along with changing to an octagonal step design, reduced the cost to £2,285. Removing all the bronze and having all carvings done on the stone reduced the figure further to £2,171. It was this lower figure that the committee accepted and ordered that the work start forthwith. The work was completed in good time and slightly under budget. It was undertaken by Edward J. Case, a local of Lynn, who the Trade Directory of 1916 describes as a monumental mason with premises on London Road. At the meeting held on the 20th of December, it was reported that the work would be completed within a few days. It was agreed that the coat of arms should be painted blue and the letters of the inscription coloured in gold. Princess Mary had agreed to unveil the memorial, and John Bowers, the Bishop of Thetford, had agreed to dedicate it. Relatives of the fallen, ex-servicemen and disabled ex-servicemen, war orphans, the subscribers and the corporation and committee were to be invited to the opening ceremony. There was also a special section allocated for local school children. A guard of honour with a band would announce the arrival of Princess Mary and start the proceedings. They were accompanied by the Girl Guide Companies of King's Lynn, who were inspected by Her Royal Highness. The ceremony was held at 2.30pm on Wednesday the 26th of January 1921 
and, according to the Lynn advertiser, was attended by a considerable amount of townspeople. At the end of the ceremony, the barriers were removed to allow for closer inspection of the monument and the laying of wreaths. General Sir Cameron Shute also stayed behind to talk to the veterans, asking where they had served and how they had been faring since demobilisation. He found several men who had served under his command during the war. You may have noticed the idea of writing the names of the fallen into a book or roll had been raised several times. Yet, it was never an idea that was properly entertained prior to the unveiling of the monument. At the next meeting of the committee in March 1921, it was decided that the remaining money from the project some thirty-eight pounds, nineteen shillings and sixpence, should be put to good use. This would fund the Roll of Honour, or Book of Heroes as it is referred to in the minutes. It is unusual as it records biographical details about the fallen. It would take two years to research before it was presented to the committee at its final meeting on the 27th of July, 1923. However, the story does not end there. After a few years, the cleaning of the memorial and the names became an issue. An offer from Holcomb Ingleby, the former mayor, arrived in July 1925, offering the property Rights and Burial Board Committee £20 towards the cost of cleaning the memorial and suggested that the coat of arms be repainted and the names picked out in black paint. At the November 1925 meeting, Edward Case's quote to clean and re-letter the names in lead paint at a cost of £90 to £100 was received. It was at this point that the idea was again raised for bronze panels bearing the names of the fallen to be attached to the memorial. It was agreed that quotes should be sought, which were then presented to the committee at the next meeting on the 31st of December 1925. At that meeting, Mr. S. B. Goslin had his tender of £135 accepted. However, the decision was sent back to the committee at a later full council meeting. Reconsidering the process, the tender of the British Guild for £114 was accepted on the 28th of January 1926. The panels were attached shortly afterwards. Thank you for listening to this history in brief about the Kings Lynn War Memorial. The Kings Lynn Borough Archives can be found within the Kings Lynn Town Hall through the Stories of Lynn Museum. See the Norfolk Record Office website for information regarding access.